134 than there is, net loss of 134 than there is 137. Plus 134 has a shorter half. When they get into California waters, they're still taking in a little bit of bomb full at 137 and losing both 137 and 134. The yellowfin tuna will only take in 137 and no 134. So this in a nutshell is what, what's happening. Then we try to calculate, well, how, by using the ratio of 134 to 137, what was the radioactivity of those fish when they first left Japan? And this is a long story, which I'm not going to have time to go into in today's uh, lecture, but suffice to say that we, we, used, we knew that when they left Japan, they should have had a ratio of 1 to 1, of 134 to 137. So we could determine when, when that ratio was, how many days before time of capture in California. And it was about uh, four months. So they took about, um, about four months to 120 days to cross the Pacific, uh, which is about when, so we think they were, they picked up the cesium in only like uh, two weeks in waters of Japan, on the order of two weeks. And the, the fish were about 15 times more radioactive in, we calculate, when they left Japan than when they got to California. So they lost most of their radioactivity during the migration to California. The radioactivity in the fish, by the time it got to California, only 3% of it was Fukushima. 97% was natural. Even in Japanese waters, we calculate that the, do the dominant radionuclide is potassium-40, even though there was 15 times more cesium in, the Japan in Japanese waters, still the natural radio radioactivity exceeded the artificial radio. Can I ask a question? Yeah. The, so, is is the is the level of radioactivity period the key metric? Because I, I, I'm a little confused because you mentioned the iodine having particular uh, impacts. Yeah. Earlier. So, so it's not just it's if you're concerned about like health either to the fish or to human consumers, if you also have to calculate the dose. So the dose is pro proportional in some ways to the amount of radioactivity. But different types of radionuclides give you different doses. So I'm going to get to that. Okay. Yeah. But then, you're on the right. You're thinking along the way. That, just curiously, no relationship between, well, I was a bit surprised about this, but at least in the, in the fish that we saw, there was no relationship between the cesium concentration and the length of the fish. Well, we published this in a prominent journal, uh, Proceedings National Academy of Sciences. And yeesh, the, the public reaction was actually the most interesting thing of the whole, the whole process. 700 newspapers in the US, at least 400 overseas, carry this often on the front page. Every newspaper except the New York Times, which is the only paper I read, but there you go. Um, <laughs> but this, it, it, it got a tremendous amount of attention. It was on every TV show, every radio station. It's not every day I get invited to be interviewed by Al Jazeera, for example. <laughs> so it, it was quite, quite remarkable, and there was, there was a lot of attention, and people were scared, and they were titillated by it. And immediately, of course, there were cartoons. This one was sent to me from uh, Boston Globe. Um, and the, the reaction. I think it is, in a sense, a legacy of Cold War era. I know people my age grew up terrified of radioactivity. I did. I was. My parents were absolutely terrified of radioactivity. I was not allowed to drink milk because milk would have strontium-90 in, 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 in the milk. And so, you know, it was, it was like a scary time. Kids were told to hide under their desks and in schools, some of you may remember that, I don't know. And there were a million science fiction movies all the time about some innocent little 
puppy walking through a radioactive cloud and turning into Godzilla and menacing uh, uh, women with uh, children on an elevated subway car in Tokyo or something like that. And, and so there are all these, we grew up with this fear about radioactivity, and it was palpable. It was greater than any fear I sense in the modern world today. Well, because the threat of warfare was, was very present. Then. Very present. It was very present. This might interest you. The total amount of radioactivity in the oceans, if you consider the total radioactivity in the oceans, 99% is natural. With all the weapons testing, with Chernobyl and Fukushima and many other events that you probably never heard of, and accidental discharges and leaks and intentional dumping, especially by the English, um, the, the total amount of radioactivity introduced into the ocean amounts to 1% of the radioactive, about 1%. 99% is natural. Of the radioactivity that was released by man, so weapons testing in Fukushima and Chernobyl, etc., 99% was released in weapons testing. So that's worth bearing in mind. So what about risks to humans if they eat contaminated seafood? Everyone wants to know, can I eat the fish? Well, um, we, we know that fatal cancers, and that's the dominant concern from radioactivity, it's not the only concern. The dominant concern is fatal cancers, and you get, it increases about 4 to 5 percent per sievert. A sievert is a unit of radiation exposure. Uh, statistically significant elevations in cancer risk are observed when doses are bigger than about 100 millisieverts, or 1,000 of a sieve. So what is the dose you get from eating tuna? Well, the dose that you get uh, from eating, say, half a pound of tuna, let's say you get a, a tuna steak, okay, of contaminated bluefin tuna, you would get 0 0.008 millionths of a sieve. The dose you would get from the potassium-40 that was present in those same fish is 0 0.1. Okay, so that's natural. That's the combined cesium isotopes. The dose you would get from eating potassium-rich foods, such as a banana, would be 0 0.1. So you would get a bigger dose from eating a banana than you would get from eating the tuna from the from the season. Yes? Have, have you, has the fish been tested since this time? Yes, we're doing that. I'll get to that. And in about five minutes? Yep. Can, 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 so okay. we can have discussion time. Sure. Thanks. Dental x-ray, five micro sequences. A flight, say from New York to LA, from the cosmic, uh, cosmic rays at 40. So just to put this into perspective, it's very low. Uh, then we consider people who eat a lot of tuna or a lot of seafood and how much they get in a year. So they would get equal to about 4.7 micro sieverts, which is equal to 47 bananas in a year. People in Japan would be exposed to more because they eat more seafood and their seafood is more contaminated. So we calculated what that was. So in Japan, they're, they're getting the equivalent of about one banana per day. It's still very low. Uh, what about the dose to the organisms themselves? And I'm gonna make this very short. There are a number of isotopes that we consider the dominant radioisotope in terms of the dose is an alpha emitting radioisotope, polonium 210. It's naturally occurring, comes from the decay of uranium, which is ubiquitously dissolved in the ocean. 
And polonium-210 is a very powerful alpha emitter, has a half-life of about four months. Um, and the dose that you get from polonium-210 that we get or that, say, the animals get is much greater from polonium-210 than from cesium or so. Polonium-210, by the way, is concentrated by tobacco plants. So when you smoke cigarettes, you get a big dose of radioactivity, very big dose, and it's from polonium-210. It's probably the most carcinogenic component of cigarettes. So the dose from polonium-210 is a couple of order, orders of magnitude higher than the dose from the cesium in the fish. And way below, this is, these are orders of magnitude, way below levels that are toxic <coughs> to the animals. I'll skip that and that. Oh, well, I, I, I simply want to say that we can use these isotopes of Fukushima as tracers of, of migration, not just for tuna, but for other species of, not just for bluefin, but for other species of tuna like albacore, for salmon sharks, for some birds, from a, for loggerhead turtles, possibly some whales. So it might be a unique opportunity. I'm going to skip a lot of this because I don't have time. But we did follow up to address a question earlier, the, the amount of radioactivity in 2012. And it was about half of what it was in 2011. We haven't yet analyzed the uh, fish that arrived this year in 2013. We're about. Um, we calculated that the swimming speed which is kind of cool. The swimming speed in migrating bluefin tuna is about five miles an hour nonstop across the Pacific. So they're swimming. They have to keep swimming when they die. So they swim about, if, if you imagine a straight line from Fukushima to San Diego, they're, they're swimming at about 500, 200 kilometers a day, or about five miles an hour. And could you just go over the, the data from the recent recent testing? I, I went over that very quickly. Sure. 2015 uh, or 2014, you said. No, the, the 2013, we yeah. haven't made any measurements. Oh. In the, 20, 2012. the 2012, this was 2011, this is 2012. Yeah, so it's the, less. The water is still leaking. It is still, still leaking, and we don't know what the radioactivity is now. We, we just uh, completed a couple of cruises off Japan, so we're going to be analyzing fish from there. And we also collected bluefin tuna that arrived in California, and we're going to be analyzing those. So all of that, but these take a lot of time yeah. and a lot of money to, yeah. to do. So you, it's not like you yeah. wave a gun, you're going to or something. Good. Got it. Um, so these are big fish. They're, this one's like an 80 kilogram uh, uh, or so fish. And the conclusion so far seem to be that uh, cesium-134 and 137 accumulate in bluefin tuna in the waters off Japan. And then they uh, carry them across the Pacific where they can still be detected. Remember, just because it can be detected doesn't mean it's necessarily dangerous. I can detect plutonium in the drinking water drink doesn't mean it's dangerous to you. Yellowfin tuna, which are residential species, show no evidence of Fukushima radioactivity. Radioactivity um, is clearly detectable in tuna in California coastal waters, but at very low concentrations, below levels that we think would have any discernible effect on either human consumers or on the fish themselves. Um, and we finally, we think that the cesium isotopes, and probably mainly cesium isotopes, would be useful in tracing the migration patterns of some other fish beyond the bluefin tuna, but that remains to be seen. So I will end it there, and thank you very much for your attention. Questions. We have about 15, 20 minutes. Sure. And we will have a reception oh. afterwards in the little I, I, I just wondered if I could just start off whether I'm interested that you're using your really interesting data to make a certain argument that we don't have to be worried. Okay. I wondered whether somebody could use the same data or to make a different argument. And clearly, you, you 
used it very brilliantly, I may say, wonderfully, to, well, to make that argument. But yeah. Is there other ways this data could be argued about to come to a different conclusion? From a public health perspective, I think not. Um, although, um, there is a school of thought, uh, and in fact, it's the predominant school of thought, which has it that there is, uh, for radioactivity, what's called a linear no threshold model of toxicity. So that means a single atom of some radionuclide will increase your chances of getting a tumor by some tiny percentage. But if you multiply that tiny percentage times the number of times six billion people on Earth, or seven billion people, you might conclude that there will be so many cancers produced. We think that flies in the face of how biology works, but that's what the models say. So people can take our data and they can conclude that. Yeah, there will be uh, you know, a certain number of can fatal cancers uh, attributable to eating these bluefin tuna. And I don't say no. I think it's very unlikely. I think you've never detected over all the other fatal cancers that occur. So if there's, for example, in Japan, if uh, a million people a year die of cancer, would you notice if it's a million and two? You might not, you probably wouldn't. But, um, but is it possible? Yes. So we are not saying categorically this is safe or not safe. We're, we're saying we think it's safe. I would not hesitate to eat it. I don't it, tell people what they should eat or shouldn't eat, but we give them the numbers mm -hmm. and the facts and they can make up their own mind. I mean, we, we you know, treat people, we want to treat them like adults and, and give them the facts and then they can make their own decisions. A lot of people get very anxious about radioactivity, and mm -hmm. if you're too anxious about it, you can eat something else. Okay. A yeah. question at the back. I'll take it in order that I see it. Heidi, and then this gentleman here. I missed you when you were explaining why you weren't looking for strontium and plutonium. I missed why that was. All right, so strontium is a beta emitter, and we don't have sophisticated beta analysis in our lab. Okay. Um, but we thought it was not likely to be a problem because, first of all, it only concentrates in the bone and fish, and so we, we don't need bones. Now, it could leach out of the bone if you were to prepare, say, a fish stew or something like that. It's possible. It's not likely, but it's possible. But also, the amount of strontium that was known to be released from Fukushima was much less than that from cesium. So we just, we said, well, we're not going to do it right now. If someone else wants to do it, we'd be delighted. And we, sh we share our fish, and we have been giving bones to other people to do strontium analyses. We haven't seen any data yet. The plutonium is primarily an alpha emitter. It's extremely toxic. Um, but it's, uh, it tends not to stay in the water column. It will drop primarily into the sediment. So, uh, and it shows essentially 0% assimilation in fish. So there's almost no plutonium in fish anywhere. Um, the plutonium can be acquired by some um, invertebrates that live in the sediment, in the mud near, for example, Fukushima. That's possible. And possibly they could be uh, uh, eaten by other fish that might assimilate a little bit. We think it's highly unlikely. We never detect it, and it's a very, very difficult and expensive analysis to do, and we're not set up to do it. But I would bet every little dime I have, which is not many, in my bank account, that you wouldn't detect any plutonium in any fish. The gentleman at the back. Oh yes, considering that the um, uh, fish around Japan had a higher level than yeah. expected, has there been any decrease in the consumption on the Japanese side? Yes. Of it? Like a lot? Yes. yes, there is a decrease. Um, and there are areas that are off limits to fishing. Now, some people ignore those limits. And so they, they go fishing anyhow. And if they go fishing in the wrong areas, they can be exposed to high levels. There are fish near Japan that are at very high 
concentrations. They're not typically eaten by people, um, but they, they could be. Um, they shouldn't be. There are all sorts of warnings up, you know, posted in Japanese uh, by the Japanese government, but there are some fish that have very elevated levels and I think would be a public health concern if people ate a lot of them. So it doesn't mean, I'm, I'm not trying to dismiss seafood as, as an irrelevant source of radioactivity for people. I think it's, it's it's extremely unlikely that um, people, even in Japan, would be exposed to a lot of radioactivity through their seafood diet. I think more likely from rice and some dairy products and, and terrestrial products near uh, in the Fukushima prefecture, but not so much seafood. But yes, there are some marine fish that do concentrate some radionuclides Higher, much higher levels than we're talking about here. Still below levels that we think are going to be uh, dangerous to people. And we actually did calculations to see how many cancers would be caused if you ate those fish. It's still low. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I just yeah, take you and then. Are there particular health effects associated with cesium? Yes, there are. And, and so it depends on the dose that you would get. And so you you could get cancer from cesium. You can get what? Cancer. Cancer. But it yeah. isn't like thyroid cancer. No. No. It's just, no, it's because the iodine goes just at the thyroid. Okay. You were given the narrative as a bit about the testing the tuna and that you didn't think there would be anything in it. I, um, I was. Why was that? Because just probably my stupidity, because I, I, I mean, I thought, why? Well, they're probably going to pick up so little radioactivity and then for them to for it to survive during the transit all the way across the Pacific. Pacific's huge. And, and I thought, nah. Yeah, I, maybe it's just my skeptical nature or whatever. So I just didn't expect to see it. Probably in retrospect, I should have realized that it could have happened. And sure enough, every single fish, without exception, was radio. Every single one. So, and very, they were all like clones of each other. So they were like, it's not like one was 10 and the other was 97. They were all the same. Yeah, I, I have two questions if you don't mind my capacity. So mm -hmm. it, sounds, yeah. it seems like it's like, but there is a difference between consuming potassium and then, consume, then consuming CCM-137 in terms mean? of human health. I mean, I'm, I'm asking you that actually. Is there? Well, there, there's, there is because of the A products from cesium-137 differ from that of, of potassium-40. Potassium-40 is actually a more energetic gamma emitter. Uh, it, it emits at 1,461,000 electron volts, whereas potassium, a uh, cesium is about 700. Because uh, it, it could sound like we eat so much, we're eating, we're so, we're eating so much radiation from bananas. I think we we're, do. All, we're all fine. We do. So it should be fine if we eat 137, cesium-137. We are if we eat very low levels, if we eat very high levels, everything's in the nose. Right. And what about, I'm curious what the biochemistry I mean, if you, you know, you could take an essential element like copper. Copper's essential in all living things, or at least all animals. Right. It's essential to us. But too much copper is very poisonous. Cat, uh, zinc would be the same. Water is the same. You could drain if you have too much water. Mm -hmm. Are, are you concerned, though, about the bioaccumulation over, over time with the fish in the Yes, so we, we, we focus a lot on that, and we focus on the trophic transfer from one trophic level to another, and we're still doing that work now. It's slow work because just we have only so many gamma detectors, and each, each sample takes three to five days, typically, to analyze properly to get statistically meaningful data. So it's just we have a backlog of hundreds and hundreds of samples in our freezers now. And it's just a matter of plowing through them one by one. Yeah, so if you're trying to take people who haven't talked and then come back to you. So, so you, had, you had mentioned that the, the radioactive bluefins sometimes swim back to Japan and spawn. So I'm wondering 
how does that impact the spawning and in terms of like generational radioactivity? Where does yeah. that radioactivity That's go? That's a really interesting question. I, 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 my guess is it doesn't because the, the dose is so low. That's a guess. But no one's looked at it. I haven't. And I don't. As far as I know, no one has. Yeah, this could be very accumulative over time. Well, it, it, it doesn't because they lose, they, they lose the cesium. And they lose it, uh, we've measured it in other species of uh, teleus or bony fish. We lose, they, they, they lose it at a rate of about 1% per day. So it's not in them forever. It's not like methylmercury, which is retained to a much greater extent in, in fish than cesium is. Methylmercury, by the way, if you eat, methylmercury is very toxic. And it's especially toxic to women who are childbearing age or, and little children. And so if, if I ate a lot of these Fukushima tuna, almost certainly the first uh, uh, sign of illness I would get would be from the methylmercury that I'm eating rather than the radioactive cesium. These are very, these fish are, have very high levels. And we're measuring those as well. Okay, we'll have two questions more and then we'll break with this. Dr. Fisher, sure. and that comes from the coal plants, right? No, well, mercury is both naturally occurring, but it's exacerbated by coal burning. And it's coal burning has actually decreased in the United States, but it's increased China. tremendously in Asia, India, and China, especially China. Well, luckily for us, I know that there is same way volcanoes produce, can produce mercury, they also produce a clay that we can intake, bentonite clay, and that helps detoxify our body from mercury? No, I don't think so. Well, the way it works is that it's positively charged, and these particles like mercury are negatively charged. No, they're not. They're not? No. <laughs> now the mercury is positive. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah, what well, kind of change do you expect to see? Though, like, I know you didn't find any change, but like, do you expect it to be smaller? Or I'm sorry. Um, the, the, the cesium. Yeah, no, no, the length of the fish in itself. Oh, you said length. you expected to find something, but you did. What were you expecting? We, we thought maybe that it would behave like methylmercury, and the bigger the fish, the higher the concentration. Concentration, not just total amount, but concentration would be higher. We didn't see that. We didn't really know what to expect. We just fishing. Fishing. <laughs> Thank exactly. you. Thank you very much.